Hello everyone, welcome to the first part of the tutorial series. In this series, we will be building a movie list app using the MDB API and Swift UI. First, let me show you the completed application using the simulator. We'll have a walkthrough of all the features that we are going to build one by one. We have a movie list as the home screen of our app. There are four sections, now playing, upcoming, top rated, and popular. For each section, we use a carousel where users can scroll the movies in a horizontal direction. For the now playing section, we show the poster image of the movie using a portrait aspect ratio. For the rest of the sections, we show the backdrop image using a landscape aspect ratio and a title text. When users tap a movie on the list, the app will push the movie detail screen. In this screen, we show all the pieces of information related to the selected movie. At the navigation bar, we have the title followed by the backdrop image. In the next section, we have the genre, runtime, Glacier and the overview description. Also, there's a rating represented by the count of stars. In the following section, you have lists of cast, directors, producers, and screenwriters. In the last section, we show the list of trailers. When users tap on the trailer, we'll pass the YouTube URL to the server web view using a model sheet presentation. Within this sheet, users can watch the trailer directly from the YouTube website. Let's move on to the second tab in the home screen, the movie search view. In this view, we have a search bar located at the top, where users can type to search for movies. The search results are shown in a list with the title and release year of the movie. When users tap on a movie, we push the movie detail screen. That's all the features of the app that we'll build in this tutorial series. To summarize, we have three main screens, list, detail, and search. To fetch the movie data, we're going to use the MDB API. So, please make sure to sign up into the moviedb.org website. After you log in, click on the API from the sidebar. We'll be using the API key v3 auth to authorize the API call. You can see the example request here. We need to pass the API key in the URL param. There are several endpoints we'll be using in our app. We're going to fetch the movie list based on the no playing, upcoming, top rated, and popular. Also, to show the movie detail screen, we need to fetch a single movie by passing the ID using this endpoint. Finally, to search movies, we'll be using the search API by adding the query text from the users in the request. That's it for the introduction of the movie list app. We're going to focus on building the movie model and TMDB API service. First, let's create a new Xcot project. Select single view app and type CFUI movie DB as the project name. Save the project into the directory that you prefer to. Let's create a model for the movie next. Let me open the JSON response of the movie list API with Visual Studio Code side by side. From the project navigator, let's create a new folder and name it models. In the folder, create a new zip file named movie. Declare the movie model using a struct that implements the codable protocol. Also, Looking at the JSON response at the root level, we have the results key 
with an array of JSON movies as the value. Let's declare movie response struct to represent this. As you can see, TMDB is using Snakecast convention for naming the fields. In Swift, we are going to use CamelCast for naming the properties. We'll customize the JSON decoder key decoding strategy to convert from Snakecast later. Let's move on to create a protocol that represents our API service. From the project navigator, create a new folder named services, then create a new file named movie service. Declare the movie service protocol. Before we declare the methods, we need to create the movie list endpoint enum. This enum represents the endpoints for the movie list API. It has four cases, now playing, upcoming, top rated, and popular. We use string as the raw type of the enum. For now playing and top rated, we override the default value to use snake case. The raw value will be appended to the URL path of the movie list API later. We also declare the description for each case, so we can show it in the movie list. To represent error when making our API call, we need to declare movie error enum that conforms to Swift error protocol. For the simplicity of this tutorial, we declare five error cases. API error, which is a generic error. Invalid endpoint, which is an error when constructing the endpoint URL. Invalid response, which is an error when the HTTP response status code is not in the range between 200 and 300. No data error, and at last, serialization error, which is a JSON decoding error. To show the error tags to the users, we implement the localized description computed property. In the body, we return the copy text for each of the error cases. To print the error text properly when the error is casted as NS error, we need to confirm to custom NS error protocol and declare the error user info dictionary property. In this case, we use the NS localized description key with the value of localized description that we created earlier. For the movie service, our first method is for fetching the movie list, given a movie list endpoint enum as the parameter. The parameter also accepts an escaping closure using the Swift result type. The type of success data is movie response. And for the error, we use movie error enum. The second method is for fetching a single movie given an ID of the movie. The type of the ID is an integer. The parameter of the success closure is the result type with the movie as the success data. The last method is for searching movies when given a query string as the parameter. The type of completion closure is the same as the fetching movie list above. Next, let's move on to build the concrete class that implements the movie service. Create a new file named movie store in services directory. Declare the movie store class to make it conforms to movie service protocol. We're going to use the singleton pattern for this class by declaring a static shared constant and set the initializer as private. This will make sure the instance can only be initialized once in the runtime. Next, let's declare the API key constant. Copy the API key v3 from TMDB website by logging into your account. Paste it in here. It looks like there's an error here, where I incorrectly instantiate the movie service protocol instead of the movie store class in the shared constant. Next one is the best API URL constant. 
Let's take a look at the HTTP request manager app for the host name. Let's copy and paste it into our code. The URL is https api.themoviedb.org. You'll also need to add additional path, which is three for the API version. To make a URL request, let's declare the URL session using shared URL session from the system. We'll also need a JSON decoder to decode the data. Let's create another class named utils.swift. In here, we declare the JSON decoder as well as the date formatter using static property. The JSON decoder key decoding strategy is to convert from snake case as the JSON response from TMDB is using snake case as naming convention. We are using a custom date formatter for the date decoding strategy. For the date token format, let's take a look at the JSON response. It is year, month, and date, which translates to yyy hyphen mm hyphen dd let's go back to moviestore.swift file declare the json decoder constant with the value of json decoder property from utils class let's implement all the required methods for the movie service protocol before that let's create a helper method to load and decode an URL into data using generic method. We'll need to constrain the generic placeholder to make sure it conforms to decodable protocol. The method also accepts an optional dictionary as the parameter. This will be converted to URL params with escape person encoding format. The completion closure is the result type with the generic placeholder as the success data type. Declare the URL components constant by initializing URL components struct. It accepts an URL. The initializer itself returns optional instance. So we need to use guard here. If the failure is nil, we just complete passing failure with invalid endpoint error. Next, we declare the query items variable. It contains the array of URL query item. URL query item itself is a struct representing URL parameter key and value. First, we have the API key URL param. The value is the API key constant we copied from TMDB dashboard. Next, we use if let to unwrap the params dictionary. If the value is not nil, we append the params by transforming it into an array of URL query item by assigning the key and value. Let's assign the query items variable to URL components query items property. At last, we can access the URL components optional URL property using the guard statement. By using this approach, all the query items will be escaped using the safe person encoding format. Next, we use the URL session data task method by passing our final URL. Inside the closure, we check if the error is not nil. If yes, we call the completion closure passing failure with API error as the result type. But as you all know, the URL session data task closure is being called in the background thread. To make sure we call the result completion in the main thread, we need to declare a helper method. This method accepts the completion closure and the result using generic placeholder. So we can constrain the data only for decodable type. In the method body, we use dispatch queue main async to switch to main thread and invoke the completion closure passing the result value. 
Let's use this helper method in the data task completion handler, just like so. Next, let's use the guard statement to cast the URL response to URL HTTP response type. We can use the tilde equal operator to check if the status code is between 200 and 300 range. If not, we return earlier by passing invalid response error as the result of the completion closure. Let's unwrap the data using the guard statement. If it is nil, let's return and pass the no data error to the completion closure. Last, we need to decode the data using the JSON decoder decode method, passing the generic placeholder type that conforms to decodable protocol. As this method can throw an error, we need to wrap it in do try catch block. If no error, we just invoke the compilation closure by passing the success decoded data as the result value. If an error is thrown when decoding, we pass the serialization error as the result to the compilation closure. At last, to make sure it works correctly, we need to invoke resume. We'll also need to declare the weak self to make sure there is no return cycle when we reference self inside the closure. Let's implement fetch movies body. First, we declare the URL by passing the best UAP URL string slash movies slash the raw value of movie list endpoint. If the URL is not nil, we invoke the load and decode method passing the URL as well as the completion closure. The Swift compiler can automatically resolve the generic placeholder as movie response truck conforms to decodable protocol. Let's copy and paste the same implementation for all the other methods. We just need to change the URL for each of the methods. For fetching a single movie, we're going to append the ID as the last path component. Also, we need to pass additional params. In this case, we're going to pass the append to URL response with the value of video and credits. Finally, for the search movie, we are going to use the slash search slash movie as the URL path. For the additional params, we set the language to n-us. And also, we make sure not to include the adult content in the response. The region is going to be US. And at last, we have the query key. This will be the text that user types in the search bar. Next, let's create an extension for the movie. Give it a name of movie plus stop that's Swift. In this extension, we declare a static helper stop for array of movies as well as single movie. This will come in handy later when we build our view using the Swift UI live preview. To do this, we need to import the JSON response files into our project. Create a new folder named resources and drag the JSON response files into the folder. You can download the JSON files by cloning or downloading the project from the GitHub repository by using the link that I provided in the description. To help us to load and decode the JSON file from the bundle, let's create an helper extension for the bundle. This is a generic method that accepts the file name of the JSON as the parameter. Using the bundle for resources method, we asked the system for the URL path in the app bundle. If found, we decode the JSON using the JSON decoder from the utils class. Let's declare a static variable named stop movies. The top of this is an array of movies. Using the 
extension method that we have declared earlier. We're going to load and decode the JSON by passing the movie list as the file name. As this is just a stop use in debugging, we can just force unwrap the values. Next, for a single stop movie, we can just use the stop movies value by accessing the first index. We're going to build the movie list screen that shows the image of the movies within horizontal carousel sections. Along the way, we're going to build image loader observable object to fetch images from the network and cache it with an S cache in memory cache. Also, we'll create the movie list state observable object to fetch movie list data given an endpoint, such as now playing or upcoming movies. So, without further ado, let's start coding and build our app. Continuing from part two, where we have built the movie model and movie service TMDB Epic client. Now let me open the preview of the UI we'll create. Let's start building the movie backdrop card. It has an image with 16 by 9 aspect ratio and a text inside a vertical stack. Create a new folder named Views from the Project Navigator. Then, create a new Swift UI file named MovieBackdropCard.Swift. Before we implement this view, we need to create image loader observable object to fetch image from the network. So, our view can subscribe and update when the image has been downloaded successfully. From the project navigator, create a new folder named bindings. Then create a new Swift file named image loader. Let's import UI kit as we are going to store UI image as the property inside our class. To cache the data locally, we use NS cache. This class is similar to a dictionary but it has a built-in mechanism to automatically release objects from the memory if the system memories are low. We also store this as a global variable. We declare image loader class and make it conform to observable protocol. We also declare image and its loading properties using publish property wrapper. With this in place, Safe UI view will be able to observe and update the view whenever one of the property is assigned with new value. We declare the image cache property and assign it using the global NS cache variable that we declare earlier. Let's fix the build issue by importing Safe UI instead of foundation. Let's create the load image method that accepts an image URL as a parameter. First, we get the absolute string of the URL and assign it in a variable. This acts as the key to retrieve the image from the cache. If the image exists, we assign it to the image property and return. To download the image asynchronously, I'm going to switch to default background thread using this patch queue. Make sure to mark self as weak to avoid return cycle. Then we can use the blocking data initializer that accepts an URL to download the image. If no error is thrown, we initialize UI image using the data in a guard statement. If success, we cache the image using the URL text as the key. At last, we switch back to the main thread and update the image property. Let's go back to movie backdrop card file and start implementing the class. The first property is the movie instance. The second one is the image loader observable object. We need to add observe object property wrapper 
for the view to receive the notifications when the published properties are updated. To display image and text vertically, we can use VStack to wrap those views. We'll set the alignment as leading. Let's use ZStack as the container for the image. Then we declare the text using the movie.title as the value. We use a rectangle shape as the pass holder when the image is nil. We set the field color as black with 0.3 as the opacity value. Next, we use if condition to check if the image value exists. If yes, we use the image view passing the UI image to the initializer. To make the image resize, we need to use the resizable modifier. Let's use the live preview to see the results. We need to pass the stop movie in the preview. As you can see, the C-Stack fill all the remaining space within the view. We can limit this by either using a frame modifier or an aspect ratio modifier. In our case, as the backdrop image is using 16 by 9 aspect ratio, we need to use aspect ratio modifier and pass fit as the content mode. Let's also pass corner radius as 8 to make the corner a bit rounded and set the shadow radius to 4. To download the image from the network, we need to invoke the image loaders load image method and pass the image URL. We can use the on appear modifier to fetch the image when the view appears on the screen. As we only have the backdrop path string, we need to create a computed property to generate the backdrop URL. To generate the backdrop URL, we need to prefix it with image.gmdb.org slash t slash p slash w500. Then we can append the backdrop path string as the last path. Let's update the invocation by passing the backdrop URL. Make sure to tap on the arrow button and build the project. You should be able to see the results of the download image in the live preview. Let's move on to the next part, to build the movie backdrop carousel. So we can put the backdrop card view in a horizontal scroll view. From the project navigator, in the views folder, create a new Swift UI file named movie backdrop carousel view .swift. The first property is the title of the section. The second one is the array of movie instances. Make sure to pass the properties in the preview initializer. In this case, we can just pass a hardcoded string and stop movies array. Let's implement the body of the view. We'll use a VStack as the container view. We also set the alignment to leading and the spacing to zero. At the top, we show the text containing the title. Using the modifiers, we set the font using title style. One way to bold and add a default horizontal padding. Below the text, we have the scroll view with the axis set to horizontal. We also set the show indicators as false to hide it when scrolling. To make a carousel in a scroll view, we need to use edge stack. Set the alignment to top and spacing to 16. Inside, we can use for each passing the movies array. Let's make movie model conforms to identifiable. By using identifiable protocol, CFUI will use the ID property to diff the value when the array changes. 
In the closure, we initialize movie backdrop card by passing the movie instance and return it. Also, we add padding for leading item if it is the first item in the array, and the padding for trailing if it is the last item in the array. Also, I just want out after the recording of this video that instead of doing this, we can also add the horizontal padding in the edge tag level. You can use that approach as it's more cleaner without additional logic. Let's build and run the live preview. Looks like the image is overflowing the container view. To fix this, we need to use the frame modifier and constraint the width to 272 and the height to 200. The result still looks pretty weird. We need to make the hex line consistent. In this case, we have to limit the number of the lines to only one. So let's go back to the movie backdrop card and add a line limit modifier and pass the value as one. The result is looking pretty good. Let's try to scroll the carousel in a horizontal direction to make sure it works correctly. Let's move on to the next part. In this part, we will be focusing on building the movie poster card that shows an image using portrait aspect ratio. Create a new Swift UI file named movie poster card in the views folder. Let's add the movie as the instance property and the image loader observable object using observe object property wrapper. Don't forget to inject the stop movie in the preview. Just like the backdrop card, we use ZStack as the container view. In this case, we use an if condition to check if the image is not nil. Then if yes, we declare the image view. Add resizable modifier, set the content mode to fit. Also, we set the corner radius to 8 and shadow to 4. If image is nil, we show a rectangle placeholder with gray color and opacity set to 0 0.3. Also, on top of that, we show a text containing the title of the movie with central alignment in case the image download fails. At last, using the frame modifier on C stack, we constrain the width to 204 and height to 306. Make sure to add on appear modifier inside the closure to invoke the image loader's image method passing the poster URL. But before that, we need to create a computed property to generate the URL using the poster path text property. Just like the approach we use to generate the backdrop URL. Let's run the live preview and see the results. Okay, looks good. Let's move on to show the posters the carousel. Create a new file named movie poster carousel view .swift in the views folder. Declare the title string and movies array as the instance properties. At last, stop the values in the preview. We use vstack to stack the title and poster card vertically. Set the VStack alignment to leading and spacing to 16. At the top, we have text containing the title, font with the title style, and the font weight as bold. And we also add a horizontal padding in both sides. Below that, we declare a scroll view with horizontal axis and set the shows indicator as false. Then we use horizontal stack with alignment set to top and spacing of 16. Using for each, we pass the array of movies. In the closure, we initialize the movie poster card passing the movie. At last, we add leading padding for the first item and trailing padding for the last item.
Let's run the live preview and see the results. Wow, looks nice. With all the views in place, we can move to build the movie list screen. Create a new CVUI file named movielistview.swift. To fetch the movie list given an endpoint from TMDB API, we need to create an observable object. Create a new Swift file named movie list state in bendings folder. Let's import Swift UI at the top. Then declare movie list state class and conforms to observable object protocol. We have three published properties as the state of fetching the data. Array of movies is loading boolean and error which is an NS error. Let's also declare the movie service interface and store it in a constant. In the initializer, we inject the service with movie store as the default value. We declare log movies method with one parameter, which is the movie list endpoint. Before fetching the data, we reset all the properties and then invoke movie service fetch movies, passing the endpoint. In the closure, make sure to use weak on self to avoid memory leak and set its loading to false. Then we can use switch statement on the result enum. If success, we retrieve the response associated value and access the result property and then assign it to the movies property. If fail, we assign the error associated value to the error property. When fetching the movie data, we want to show some kind of visual feedback to the user. So, let's build this component, create a new file named activity indicator view.swift inside a UIKit views folder. In UIKit, we can use UI activity indicator view for this purpose. While in Swift UI, Apple doesn't provide this kind of view. To solve this, Apple provides UI view representable protocol where we can use it to show UI kit view in a Swift UI view. Declare a new struct named activity indicator view that conforms to UI view representable. There are two required methods to implement. The first one is the make UI view method that expects us to return an UI view. This protocol is using associated type generic. In this case, we replace the placeholder with UI activity indicator view. In the body, we initialize the view passing large as the indicator style. Then we invoke start animating, then return the view. The other method is update UI view method. In our case, we can leave this as empty. Let's move on to the next component where we'll use the activity indicator view in. Create a new file named in loading view.swift. The purpose of this view is to act as a container for the activity indicator view. When we load the data from the network and if an error occurs, we have two state properties, this loading and error. Also, one optional property closure that we call retry action. In the body implementation, we use the group view. With this view, we can return a dividend view depending on the conditional condition. If its loading is true, we return the activity indicator view inside a hashtag between a spacer to center it. If error is not nil, we show the error copy in a vstack. If the retry closure exists, we add a retry button that invoke the closure given by the parent view. Let's see how this works later when we build the movie list view. Let's go back to the movie list view file and begin implementing the view. The approach we are going to use here is to fetch the movie list endpoint independent of each other. In this case, we have four movie list endpoints. So, let's declare four observe object properties for each of the endpoint. No playing, upcoming, popular, and top-rated. In the body, 
will use a navigation view as the root view because we are going to push the movie detail screen later on. Then we declare list view as the vertical scroll view for the carousels. For each of the movie list state, we are going to check if the state movies array properties exist. If exist, we are going to display the carousel view. Else, we display the, the loading view we just built in the previous section. For the no playing section, we use movie poster carousel view to show the poster image. For the rest of the sections, we use movie backdrop carousel view to show the backdrop image. In the loading view retry closure, we need to pass the correct endpoint to refetch the data in case of retrying an error. We set the navigation bar title as the movie DB. Finally, we need to add on appear modifier on the navigation view so we can fetch the data when the navigation screen appears on the screen. Let's try to run the app in the live preview. Awesome! The movie data is successfully displayed on the screen, but there are two things we can improve. First, the horizontal painting on the carousel looks odd. Second one, we have to remove the line separator for each row. When using a list view, we can use the list row insets modifier to customize the insert in four directions. In this case, we want to set the leading and trailing to zero, so the carousel can scroll from edge to edge. We also want to add some insets on the bottom and top padding, so there's a vertical edge spacing between sections. Currently in Civ UI, there is no API that we can use to remove the separator from the list. But there's a little hack that I found where we can use UI table view appearance proxy and set the separator style to none, so we can remove the separator. For the reminder, this will remove the separator for all the lists in the Civ UI app. In our case, this is the behavior that we want. We'll be focusing on building the movie detail screen. Along the way, we're going to fetch the data for a movie, then display pieces of information in a list. Finally, we'll learn how to display a Safari view controller in Civ UI to show the YouTube video using UI view controller representable. So, let's open Xcode and start coding. We're going to continue from part 2, where we have successfully built the movie list screen. Let me open the preview file to show you the movie detail screen. First, we'll focus on building the navigation title and the movie banner image. Let's create a new file named moviedetailview.swift in the views folder. Declare a movie ID instance property inside the class. We'll pass the ID of the selected movie when instantiating this view. Next, to handle loading data from the TMDB API, we need to create an observable object. Create a new Swift file named Movie Detail State. Declare the class that implements to observable object protocol. Declare the Movie Service API client as a private constant. For the published properties, we declare movie is loading an error. Then we create an initializer with movie service as the parameter. Then we assign the movie store singleton as the default value. We set it to the movie service instant property. Next, declare the load movie method. It accepts a single ID integer as the parameter. First, we set the movie to nil and set its loading to false to reset the state. Then we invoke fetch movie, passing the ID of the movie. Inside the closure, make sure to declare self as weak to avoid memory leak when referencing self. Then, set is loading to false and use a switch statement on the result enum. In case of success, we retrieve and assign the associated value to movie property. Then, for a failure case, Assign the associated value to the error property. Navigate back 
to the movie detail view. Then declare the movie detail state property using observe object property wrapper. Assign the movie detail state instance as the default value. Also, we need to pass the movie ID in the movie detail view initializer located at the bottom of the file. Let's implement the body next. We use CStack as the container view. Then we declare the loading view passing is loading state and optional error property. With this, the activity indicator view will be shown when the movie is being fetched. In the retry closure, we just invoke the load movie passing the movie ID to reload the data. Before we declare the list, let's set the navigation bar title first. The value is the title of the movie. As it can be empty when fetching is still in progress, we need to provide an empty string as the fallback value. Make sure to add on appear modifier where we load the movie and passing the ID to the state when the screen appears. Also, to enable navigation in the live preview, we need to wrap the movie detail view in the preview class at the bottom. For the list, we create a new view called movie detail list view. Declare a movie constant as a single property. In the body, we use list view as the container. At the top of the list, we have the banner image of the movie. Let's create a new component for this as it has its own state to handle the loading of the image from the network. Declare a new view named movie detail image. To handle loading the image, we declare the image loader observe object as the property and also the image URL to load. In the body, we declare a z-stack. At the bottom, we use a rectangle as the placeholder when fetching the movie. We set the fill color to gray and opacity to 0.3 using the modifier. On top of that, we check if the image has been downloaded. Then, we declare the image passing the image data and set it to resizable. Then using the aspect ratio modifier at CZEC, we set the aspect ratio to 16 by 9 and content mode as width. At last, we use the on appear modifier to fetch the image passing the image URL. Let's declare this into the top of the movie detail list view and see the results with the live preview. Looks like we forgot to add the movie detail list view inside the movie detail view. So let's add it at the top. So let's build and run it again. Yeah, looks good. Let's remove the extra padding on both horizontal sides by setting the list row insets and pass edge insets top, leading, bottom, trailing to zero. Moving on to the next part, we're going to build the section containing the information of the movie, genre, release, year, runtime, overview, and rating. As the movie model currently doesn't have genre-related property, we need to create it first. Let's take a look at the JSON response. It's actually an array of JSON objects containing the ID and name. Navigate to the movie.swift file, declare the genres property in the movie. The type is an array of movie genre. At the bottom of the file, declare a new struct named movie genre and conforms to decodable protocol. Next, declare the single property name. We don't need to declare ID as the property. Go back to the movie struct and declare a computed property called genre text. In the implementation, we just get the first index from a generous array and use the name property. Next, we create a computed property to show the rating stars, named rating text. First, we cast the fourth average double property to an integer. This will remove the fraction and run down the number to simplify the logic to display the stars. As we are going to use a star emoji to show the rating. By using a half close range operator that starts from 0 to the rating integer, we use a reduce method to add and accumulate the value with stars emoji. At last, 
we return their soul. The sites the stars count will display the score of the rating in terms of 1 to 10. Declare the score tax property. Using God's statement, we check the count of rating tax is greater than 0. If yes, we just use string interpolation on the rating text and suffix it with slash 10. The next one is the text for the year. To show the year, we need to create a new date formatter and set the format to YYY. With the formatter, we can use a guard statement to invoke the get date from the release date text. And then use the year date formatter to get the formatted string from the date. The next one is the text for duration. We can use the runtime property for this. It is a representation of total running seconds for the movie. To format it to show into a format like 1 hour 30 minutes, we can use that component formatter. Let's declare the duration formatter, set the unit style to full, and allow units to hours and minutes. At last, we can use the formatter and pass the runtime second of the movie multiply it by 60, because the formatter is ex expecting a unit of minutes. Let's go back to the movie detail list view. Below the movie detail image, declare a H tag. Inside, we declare the text containing general text, text containing hardcoded dot string as a separator, the text for movie year, and the text for movie duration. Moving on to the next row, Let's declare the movie overview text. Then, we declare an H tag. If movie rating text is not empty, we display the star's rating text and set the foreground color to yellow. Then, at last, we display the score text. Let's use a divider below to add a horizontal line for clearer visual separation between sections. In the next section, we'll show the credits of the movie, cast, directors, producers, and screenwriters. We need to add the credits property to the movie model. Let's take a look at the JSON response. The movie JSON has credits field containing JSON of crews and cast. For the cast, we only need the name property, while for the crews, we need the name and the job. With job, we can filter the crews based on the producer, director, and screenwriters. Let's navigate back to movie.swift file. Scroll to the bottom and add a new struct named movie credit. Next, declare a movie cast struct. Add ID, character, and name as the property. Then, declare movie crew with ID, job, and name as the properties. Go back to the movie credit and declare cast property with movie cast array as the type. Then, crew property with movie crew array as the type. With this in place, we can declare the credits property, which is using movie credit as the type. We'll set this as optional as this property is not returned when we fetch the movie list API. Next, we declare the cast and crew's computed property. With this, we can retrieve the cast and crew from the credits property. To get the directors, producers, and screenwriters, we declare the computed properties. Inside, we just filter the crew array based on the job string, director, producer, or story. Now, let's go back to the movie detail view and build the credit section. To stack the cast and crew horizontally, we can use H stack. Set the alignment as top and spacing to 4. Then, we declare a stack with alignment of leading and spacing of 4. To stack the staring cast, at the top, we show the title text and set the font as headline. Then using for each, we pass the cast of the movie. In this case, we only want to display the first 9 casts. So we can use the prefix method in the array. In the closure, we just display the name text of the cast Oh, looks like the compiler is complaining. 
as for each needs movie cast to conform to identifiable protocol. Let's add this to the struct. We add a frame modifier passing 0 as minimum width and infinity as the maximum width. Then we add a spacer. We'll use this so the VStack can have equal spacing with the other VStack containing the cruise that we'll create next. Next, we declare the VStack for the cruise data. As cruise can be empty and nil, we'll use conditional before declaring the VStack. First, we check if movie director's count is greater than zero. Then we declare the director text and using for each passing the array of directors. In this case, we only want to show the maximum of two crews. Let's also add the same conditional check for the movie cast, as it is possible for the cast to be empty. Then let's move this into the edge tag to show it besides the cast. Make sure to set the font as headline for the heading text. Let's do the same approach for producers and writers. Also, add some padding in the producer and screenwriter text to add some vertical spacing. That's it for the crew sections. Don't forget to add the divider at the bottom. Next, let's move on to create the trailer section. Whenever the user taps on one of the trailer, we'll present a model sheet showing the Safari V controller containing the YouTube page for playing the video. Let's create the movie video struct to represent the trailer. Navigate to the movie instance and declare the struct at the bottom of the file. Let's take a look at the JSON response for the videos. We'll be needing ID key, name, and site. Then, we declare the movie video response struct with results property containing array of movie videos to match the JSON response hierarchy. At last, we declare a computed optional property called YouTube URL. As video can come from a different site, in our app, we only want to show the trailers from YouTube. So, using God's statement, we check if the site equals to YouTube. Then, we construct the URL by prefixing it with https youtube.com slash watch and adding additional URL param passing the key property. Back to the movie body, we declare a videos property with type of optional movie video response. Then, at last, we declare a YouTube trailers computed property, which returns an array of movie videos with a valid YouTube URL. Let's go back to the movie detail view below the last divider. We check if the movie's YouTube trailers array is not empty. If exists, we show the trailer text, set the font as sub headline, we use for each and pass the trailers. In the closure, we use a button and let's leave the action closure empty for now. For the view inside the button, we declare an edge tag containing the text of the trailer name, spacer, and image with SF icon with the name of play.circle.fill. Then we set the foreground color to system blue. Next, we need to create a view to host the Safari view controller. Create a new file named Safari View in UIKit Views folder. Import Safari services and Swift UI at the top of the file. To host a view controller in Swift UI View, we can use the provided UI View Controller Representable Protocol. Declare Safari View and make it conform to UI View Controller Representable. We need to implement two required methods. Let's declare one instance property named URL. The first required method is make UI view controller, which expects us to return a UI view controller. In this case, we replace it with Safari view controller. In the implementation, we can just initialize it, pass the URL from the instance property, and return it. Let's leave the other method implementation as empty. 
go back to movie detail view then declare a state property to store the trailer when the user selects from the list then in the button action closure we just need to assign the selected trailer to the property to present the model sheet we just need to add sheet modifier at the bottom pass the selected trailer state as the binding item then in the closure we just initialize and return safari view passing the trailer from youtube URL. let's try and run from the live preview to make sure everything works scroll to the bottom and tap one of the trailer nice the safari vc is presented perfectly there is one little bug though where when we dismiss the model sheet the image banner will blank out of nowhere i don't really know why this happened maybe it's a bug from cvui but i have found a solution we just need to declare observe object for the image loader in the movie detail list view and pass it to the movie detail image so let's do this try to run again looks like all is good finally we need to add navigation link on the movie list screen so it can navigate to the movie detail screen whenever the user taps on the movie from the carousel in the list let's add this to the movie backdrop carousel and movie coaster carousel views we just need to wrap the view in navigation link then pass the movie detail view in initializer also we need to set the button style as plain button style otherwise the image will be overlaid by a blue background let's try and run the app to test the navigation just select a movie from the list and voila we successfully navigate to the movie detail screen we're going to build the search movies feature into the app we'll learn on how to use ui search bar on Steve UI and using the combined framework to throttle observable query text typed by the user before we make an API call. Without further ado, let's open Xcode and start coding. We continue right off from the previous part where we have successfully built the movie detail screen that shows the pieces of information of a single movie. Let me open the preview file to show you the search screen we'll build. The search movie screen has a search bar located at the top of the screen. Then a list for showing the results of the movie searched by the user. Each of the movies has a title and release year text. The movie screen itself is located in the same hierarchy as the movie list screen using a top bar view at the bottom. From the project navigator, create a new CIF UI file named movie search view. Let's fill the body with a navigation view at the root level, so we can navigate to the movie little screen when the user taps on the row in a list. Declare the list, put a single text for placeholder, so we can build the project without error. We need a search bar at the top of the screen. As if UI currently doesn't have a search bar component, we need to bridge UI search bar to Swift UI using UI view representable protocol. Declare a new Swift file named search bar view inside the UI kit views folder. Import Swift UI at the top of the file, then declare the search bar view struct that conforms to UI view representable protocol. There are two properties we have to declare. The first one is the placeholder text. The other one is the text string. As the parent view will pass the state, we need to use binding property wrapper. So any update to this property will be propagated back to the object who owned the state. Next, let's implement the required methods. The first one is the make UI view method. Let's use UI search bar as the return type. In the body, we initialize UI search bar, passing zero as the frame rectangle. Assign the placeholder property with the placeholder property we declare. Then set the search bar style as minimal. 
set the enable return keys automatically as false. So the return button is always enabled even if the text is empty. At last, return the search bar. The second one is the update UI view method, which invoke the first time the search bar shown. In this case, we assign the text property value to the search bar text. Before we can use this view, we need to receive a callback whenever the user is typing on the keyboard. So, we need to implement UI search bar delegate, which requires a class type. To solve this, Apple provides a way for us to use a coordinator object. Let's declare the coordinator class as a subclass of NS object. Also, let's confirm the UI search bar delegate protocol. Declare a text property using binding property wrapper. As this is a class type, there is no default initializer. We need to create it by ourselves. Then, inside the initializer, we need to prefix the text with an underscore to assign the binding passed in the initializer as the projected value. For the UI search bar delegate methods, the first method we implement is search bar text did change. In this case, we update the text property using the search bar's text. The following method is search bar search button click. In this case, we want to dismiss the keyboard. We can use the search bar's resign first responder method. At last, we need to implement the Mac coordinator method to initialize and return the coordinator object. Let's initialize the coordinator and passing the text binding using dollar prefix as the parameter. Don't forget to implement and set the search bar delegate to the context coordinator in the Mac UIV method. Let's navigate back to the movie search view and declare the search bar view at the top of the list. It requires us to pass the binding text. We need a state property. Let's use an observable object for that. Declare a new CIF file named movie search state inside the bindings folder. Import CIF UI, combine, and foundation at the top. Declare movie search state class that conforms to observable object protocol. We have four published properties that represent the state of the movie search. First, the text which the user types. Second, movies, an array representing the response of the search movie from the API. Third, is loading, a Boolean property representing whether the data fetching from the API is currently in progress. Fourth, error, an NS error that indicates if there is an error when making the API call. We'll use the combined framework to subscribe to the observable text value and throttle the updated value to one second. So we'll wait until the user stops typing on the keyboard up to one second before making an API call. It helps to reduce the number of API calls when the user is typing fast, as we don't have to fetch the data every time the user types a new character. Declare a subscription token property to store the token. We'll be removing the token when the object gets the initialized. Declare the movie service property. Then, create an initializer that accepts a movie service. The default value is the movie store. Let's assign this to the movie service property. Let's declare a method named startObserve, which will be invoked when the movie search fee appears on the screen using the onAppear modifier. First, using guard statement, we check if the subscription token is not nil. If it exists, we return early. To access the observable from the query, we can use a dollar sign as the prefix. We're going to use the observable chaining. First, we use a map operator. This allows us to transform the value to another value. In this case, we only want to reset the error and the movie properties values. Then return the same value. For the following chain operator, we use throttle, passing one second as the interval. Set the schedule to be dispatched in the main thread using dispatch queue main. Then pass through as the lattice, as we don't need to receive the initial query value. We use the sync operator to subscribe to the value from the chain. In the closure, 
we receive the value of the query and invoke the search method passing the query. Let's declare the search method that accepts a single parameter, which is the query string. Here, we reset all the state properties to the default value. Then, using guard statement, we check if the query text is not empty. For your info, Combine also provided a filter operator that we can use before in the observable chain. I'll leave that to all of you as the exercise to practice using the Combine framework. Next, we set the is loading property to true. Then, using the movie service, we invoke the search movie method passing the query. In the closure, we declare self as weak to avoid memory leak by return cycle. Then, using guard, we check if the current value of query property equals to the query we pass to the search movie API. It's possible when the searching is still waiting for the response from the API, the user already types a new search query. At last, we set is loading back to false and use the switch statement on the result enum value. In case of success, we assign the movie property from the associated value. And in case of failure, we assign the error property with casted and as error. Finally, we need to remove the subscription token of server in the, the init by invoking cancel so the object can be released from the system's memory. Go back to movie search view and declare the movie search stat property using observable object property wrapper. Let's complete the search bar view implementation and pass the binding query text from movie search state. Let's run the live preview to see the results of our work. Let's add the navigation bar title using a hard-coded search string. We'll need to fix the extra horizontal padding on both sides by using list row insets modifier. We can pass 8 as leading and trailing value. Let's run. Looks good. Next, let's declare the loading view to show the loading indicator when we fetch the search result from the TMDB API. In the initializer, we pass the is loading state property from the movie state, the error and retro closure. In the closure, we invoke the movie search state search movie passing the query text. Let's declare the list for showing the results of the movie. We need to use if conditional statement to check if the value of the movies from the state properties isn't nil. Then, we use for each passing the movies array to the initializer. In the closure, we wrap the view using a navigation link, so the user can navigate to the movie detail view when the row is tapped. In the navigation link, we declare a VStack with leading alignment, and then we declare the title and year text for the movie. Next, make sure to add on up here modifier and inside the closure we can just invoke the movie search state start observe method. Let's build the app and run the live preview. Type into the search bar to search your favorite movie. Then tap on the road to navigate to the movie detail screen. Let's move on to the final part, where we will add the tab view containing the movie list and movie search screen within the same hierarchy. Navigate to contentview.swift file. In the body, declare tab view as the root view. Then, for the first tab, we declare the movie list view. Then, by using the tab item modifier, we can customize the title and icon of the tab. We need to use a fish tag. Then, we declare the image passing TV from the SF symbol as the NAS system name. Then, for the text, we pass movies. We also need to add a unique hashable tag modifier for each tab. Let's pass 0 for the first tab. Let's do the same for the second tab, the movie search view. For the image, we use magnifying glass FF symbol. And for the text, we use search string. Let's pass 1 as the tag value. That's it. 
Let's build and run the app from the live preview to test. The top bar is now shown at the bottom, and we can switch tabs between movie list and the movie search. Congratulations on finishing this tutorial. To summarize, we have built a custom search bar component using US search bar with UI view representable. Then, we created the movie search state observable object and used combine to subscribe to the observable query text. In the process, we use the observable operator to throttle the query text. Finally, we built the top bar to contain the movie list and movie search within the same hierarchy. Thanks everyone for following the tutorial series. If you like and want to support this channel, please like, share, and subscribe. It really motivates me to keep producing video tutorials. So until the next one, let's keep the lifelong learning goes on. Bye.